Hi, I'm Christy McDonald, and here's what's coming up on One Detroit Arts and Culture. The Penny Stamps Distinguished Speaker Series at the University of Michigan and celebrated filmmaker Ken Burns this week. Plus, the social justice message in plant installations, botanical artist Lisa Wad. Then Peter Worf's conversation on the history of the University Musical Society at U of M and a performance of the original work called Justice that premiered at the Detroit Jazz Festival. It's all coming up right now on One Detroit. From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support for this program provided by the Cynthia and Etzel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. The Kresge Foundation, Community Foundation for Southeast Michigan. The DTE Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public TV, among the state's largest foundations committed to Michigan-focused giving. We support organizations that are doing exceptional work in our state. Visit DTEFoundation.com to learn more. Business Leaders for Michigan, dedicated to making Michigan a top 10 state for jobs, personal income, and a healthy economy. Nissan Foundation, Ally, and viewers like you. Hi there and welcome to One Detroit. I'm Christy McDonald. So glad that you're with me. This show is all about arts and culture in the Detroit area and we get a chance to bring you performances, interviews, and stories from the arts organizations you may be missing. We have a lot coming up on the show, including an event with filmmaker Ken Burns at the University of Michigan this week. We'll let you know how you can be a part of the Penny W. Stamps Distinguished Speaker Series with Ken Burns on October 2nd. Plus, flower installations around Detroit this summer with a social justice message. See what's behind Lisa Wad's creations. Then, Peter Worf from WRCJ looks back at the history of the University Musical Society at the U of M with former leader Ken Fisher. And we'll end up with a moving performance that opened up the Detroit Jazz Festival, an original piece called Justice. But we're starting with the Penny Stamp Speaker Series at U of M. Every Friday night, distinguished speakers, arts innovators, and performers come to the University of Michigan to bring their perspective and knowledge. Detroit Public TV is partnering up with the university to bring the live stream to a wide audience. Will Glover spoke with series director Christina Hamilton about the speaker lineup this fall and working to bring in filmmaker Ken Burns on October 2nd. For those who are uninitiated, what is the Penny Stamp Distinguished Speaker Series? You know, give us a little bit of background. Who started it? Why? And when was that? Well, the Penny Stamp Distinguished Speaker Series was actually started by a woman with the name of Penny Stamps. Uh, yeah, not just a great name, but a great woman. Uh, and she basically, you know, she was an alum of the University of Michigan. And she wanted to give back to the university, specifically to students, to be able to create a way that they could, uh, you know, have some kind of connection to creative people who were successful out in the world, sort of outside the walls of academia. So, you know, real creative practitioners. She was a graduate, I should say, of the art and design program. Uh, and she was a designer herself. Um, and so, you know, we started, I mean, I think when she started sort of coming up with this idea it was in the late 90s, in the early 2000s, we actually sort of formalized the program, took it outside of the school and off the campus and into the community because there was this kind of this other idea then that actually it's really about building all kinds of uh, connections and, net, you know, everybody, when you build your network of people, it's sort of like your, your access in the world and, and your sort of, you know, opportunities to open doors and have success are based on making connections and knowing people. And so we wanted to even go beyond this idea of bringing, you know, these great successful uh, creative practitioners in for students to meet, but get them acquainted with the, with the population around them, the geography of this area, the incredibly interesting and vibrant fabric, uh, fabric, sorry, uh, a dynam dynamic uh, people that we have that are creators right here that they could connect with too. And then it's sort of, you know, it works as a feedback loop because it's also really great for all of, uh, you know, our folks in the local community, they get to be part of that loop too. 
how do you decide who's going to participate or who's going to be a, a featured speaker? So, you know, we're looking for people that fit the tenor of the moment. We're looking for, you know, I, we also want to put together a season that's very uh, dynamic and eclectic in that I always say not every single program is for everyone, but there is a program for everyone within every season. So, you know, if you don't like, you know, what we have this week, come back next week because it just might be the thing that changes your life, you know. Um, so we really like, you know, I try to go for, you know, an eclectic mix of media and people and ideas and perspectives so that, you know, we are kind of trying to, I mean, each of us gets an opportunity, right, to understand more about other people and their viewpoints in the world around us. And then also find those moments that really resonate with us and go, oh yeah, you know, that's, that's, that's really stirring my gravy. Uh, also in that we have coming up quickly, actually Ken Burns and Isabel Wilkerson uh, talking about race in America. I think that is going to be, I, we just had a production meeting on that last week and that is, they, the two of them together talking was just so exciting. What was it that steered you towards having those two have a conversation together? The whole genesis of that idea came from a program that was from the Penny Stamp Series Archive that we uh, streamed this summer in our streaming partnership with DPTV. This was, and I, I think it was in, maybe it was early July. Yes, because I think we did it, it was around 4th of July. And we streamed a program uh, that we had done quite a few years back now, uh, where, we, where we hosted uh, Bill T. Jones, the choreographer and dancer, Bill T. Jones, who's just a dynamo. Uh, and this was specifically a moment where he had uh, created a piece about Lincoln. And uh, he gave a talk about the creation of this piece and, and this you know, really interesting sort of struggle in his own mind that he went through in his relationship with Lincoln in creating this piece. Um, and while I was watching this, I was like, wow, you know, I'd really like to get Bill T. Jones back to talk. And wouldn't it be interesting to have something about, you know, the role of the presidency, you know, sort of looking back to this time with Lincoln and what's, you know, what, what does that mean to the role of the presidency now? And that was sort of the beginning of the genesis. Through further conversation, I mean, I had then a number of conversations with a lot of different people. We had a lot of different ideas about who the people that would be in that conversation um, would be. Um, and it was actually, and Ken Burns had come up at some point and I immediately got into a conversation with him. And then his biggest desire was to speak with Isabel Wilkerson. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, we're gonna get her. And then we did. <laughs> You can see Ken Burns on the Penny Stamp series at dptv.org, 8 p.m. on Friday, October 2nd. And for more info on the speaker lineup, just head to our website at onedetroitpbs.org. Okay, flowers can bring joy in our front yards and parks, and intricate floral design is a special kind of art. I caught up with Lisa Wad this summer, who is a well-known botanical artist. She works out of Detroit. And during the summer, she created floral installations around the city with messages of social justice. At the same time, the creations raised money for Michigan flower farmers that have been hurt during the pandemic. Explain to people what a botanical artist does. Well, I do large scale installations with plants and flowers. That's the easy way to say it. <laughs> How did you get started doing that? You know, I grew up in northern Michigan, and so I always had that connection with nature. And I um, studied horticulture, landscaping. I've been a professional gardener or a florist my whole career. And um, recently just took, took the step to um, produce large-scale installations full-time. So you've been able to do um, installations for music videos. Uh, you even decorated the set for Jimmy Fallon. Explain, I mean, how you were able to, to get in through all those avenues and, and create art, really, with the beautiful things that we see outside. So I think it all really culminated with a, a massive project that I did in 2015 called Flower House, where I bought a house on auction in the city of Hamtramck here in Detroit. And um, with the help of about 30 other florists and about, I think it was 106 volunteers, we filled the interior of the house with flowers. So every room was just crawling and dripping and growing, overflowing with flowers and plants. And 
I think that really caught the attention of a lot of people worldwide. So we think of everything that's been impacted uh, during COVID-19. What has the impact been across the industry? I'm delighted to see that people are really returning to gardening and looking to the space they have in and around their homes. I've had flower gardens and grown flowers, but this is the first year that I've grown uh, food. So <laughs> I, think, I think I am not alone in that, where I'm exploring how to utilize the ground around our houses now. Mm -hmm. So I think that's really exciting. Um, but I, I did see a, a need with uh, local flower farmers that usually in June, having been a florist for a decade, um, every single Saturday you have one or two or 10 weddings. And I really could see that the flower farmers had all these beautiful flowers with nowhere to sell them. So I thought, gosh, I wish I still had an event, a wedding every weekend. And I was like, well, let's create one. So I came up with this idea um, so I could still support the flower farmers. So tell us about Big Flower Friend. What is it? Mm -hmm. So Big Flower Friend is a series of installations uh, throughout the month of June and into the first week of July. Um, every Thursday, I do an installation somewhere in the city of Detroit. I am working with the editors of a guidebook called Bell Isle to Eight Mile. And um, we are choosing um, really interesting locations in the city for me to go and um, do an installation that is um, a reflection on that location. So what have some of the places been and what can you tell people how to find it and, and look for it and follow it? The first installation that I did was at a former home of Marvin Gaye's and it was over on Outer Drive and um, I did an installation that um, the shape was twofold. It, um, it was kind of this arch and um, had a gold vase with some really beautiful red anemones coming out of it. Um, I had read in the guidebook that in this home, this was where what's going on was conceived. And I heard that it was in classic 60s, 70s, uh, sunken living room on a gold piano. So I kind of gave a little nod to that with the shape, as well as the shape we've heard of flattening the curve of Corona, staying home and being safe. So it kind of, I was, um, it was a little double dip with the shape there. Mm -hmm. And another, um, the last week's location was at the Burwood Wall in um, Alfonso Wells Memorial Park over um, in the Eight Mile Wyoming neighborhood. And this is um, a really moving location. This is a wall that was built in 1941 um, as a physical um, a barrier between black and white neighborhoods during redlining. And it still exists. We can go and see it and learn from the neighbors there. And so um, I, I started thinking of this project as a way um, I hook people with the flowers, but then I educate them when they're there. So if people want to continue to follow it, where are you putting out the information? Where can they see it? It's on social media? You can find it at Instagram, which is Lisa Wad botanical artist. Um, and then um, for those of um, our viewers who aren't on social media, I do keep my website updated. So it's lisawad.com and there's a button for Big Flower Friend there. For the latest projects Lisa is working on, just head to our website at onedetroitpbs.org. We'll connect you there. For those of you who are classical music and jazz fans, you probably already know that Detroit Public Television also runs WRCJ radio station, 90.9 FM. One of our well-known voices on the air is Peter Worf. Peter has been doing a lot of interviews for us here on One Detroit Arts and Culture. And this week, he sits down with Ken Fisher, the former head of the University Musical Society of the University of Michigan. Ken retired three years ago, but he has a new memoir out that looks back at his 30 years leading UMS. Ken, you're from Michigan. You grew up as a, a young musician. You spent time, a lot of time, up at uh, the Interlochen Academy in the summers. You were a horn player in the orchestra. When you hear the, the, the opening of the last movement of Brahms' first symphony, <laughs> uh, do, does that, how does that take you back in the the time machine that is music. I, I started out at Interlochen as a trumpet player. You know, I was a 10 year old cornet player, but I took music talent exploration under a guy named Arthur Williams from Oberlin College. And every week he'd try a different instrument. By the sixth week, seventh week, he said, yeah, try to French horn, you buzz your lips. But Ken, 
it's so much more diverse, you know, it's so much more interesting than a cornet. So at age 10, I began to think about this, this might be the instrument. And when I came back uh, in 1957 as an intermediate camper, I was solidly a French horn player. So I, I, I came back in 1961, um, I didn't think I had a very good audition, but the horn teacher there, Marvin Howe, said, Ken, I'm, I'm putting you first chair because you've been around for a while. You know where the music goes. You're a nice guy, but you'll find your proper spot by the end of the first week when you'd be challenged by somebody better. Well, what he didn't know is, is I'd been first horn in the Michigan Youth Symphony all that previous year, and we played Sibelius' second symphony, great horn part. And that's what we were playing that week. So I was able to keep my seat. I lost it for a couple of weeks, but for the final week, you always played a Brahms symphony and you always played Liszt Le Prelude. And uh, for me to have the opportunity to play those wonderful horn calls at the, at the top of that, uh, da, 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 was a great thrill. Then of course, the next year, we're going to the White House. Well, I'll, I'll be first horn at the White House. And I gotta tell you, these sophomores and juniors came up, cleaned my clock, I barely got into the White House Orchestra, but uh, it just goes to show that's what's great about Interlock, and you got that next generation always coming up. And most of those kids that that followed me became professional horn players. One of the big moments that you share in your book is a moment that you spent in the dressing room with Leonard Bernstein. Uh, tell us about bringing him uh, under your leadership back to uh, Hill Auditorium with the Vienna Philharmonic. Now, I knew and he knew that he was planning a 70th birthday tour the following year, and there would only be a, a limited number of, uh, of invitations. And so one of the things you loved about Bernstein was he would meet every single person that was in line to meet him backstage. And that might be two hours because that line would go out, out the door. And don't you love that about an artist of his stature? Anybody in line, I'm going to meet. And so it's midnight. He's finally uh, there. So I go in. I'm tall. Bernstein is short. In any case, he's even shorter when he's sitting down. And I needed to ask him an important question. I decided to get on my knee to look him in the eye. And I said something like, Mr. Bernstein, uh, next year, your 70th birthday and our 75th anniversary of Hill, we'd love to have you back next year. But these are exact, his exact words. Ken, I love this town. I love the people of this town and I love this hall. We'll be back. And sure enough, shortly thereafter, four cities were determined. There would be uh, New York, Washington, Toronto, and Ann Arbor. But that was his last tour uh, with the uh, Vienna Phil. He died two years later. We feel so fortunate to have had him here. But, but you learn, take advantage of these opportunities when you can be with an artist alone. What did it mean to have a, 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 a giant and a man like Wynton Marsalis to give, give the forward to your, to your memoir? Well, you know, he, he and I had become friends over the years, uh, but I got to tell you, I had no idea he would do the kind of forward that he did. And uh, I cried when I read it. And uh, I wrote to him right afterwards and I said, do you know how much this means to me? And then he reflected on it and he said, you know, I reread it and I cried, he said. So we had built a really special relationship, you know, and he, what I love about what he wrote, uh, Peter, is that it, it connects with any presenter in the world. Any one of us that, that, that does what I do, Winton was speaking to them. And in effect, it was his love letter to a presenter, no matter where you are. I, I knew that he liked UMS, but when he wrote in there, um, I've been touring for 40 years and nobody does it better than UMS. It was really, it was really very touching. We're going to leave you with a powerful performance from the Detroit Jazz Festival. It's called Justice and it opened up the festival this year. It was a way for the musicians to express the emotions and feelings tied in with racial injustice. There are four movements to it, but the one you're about to see and hear is the second movement written by Chris Collins. It's called Fear and the Fearless and it's described as how we choose to face fear. We can run or we can find strength and courage to confront fear head on. Enjoy this moving performance and I'll see you next time. Take care. I knew Martin Luther King Jr. He was my hero 
my leader, my friend, my brother, and my colleague in the struggle for civil rights and social justice in America. He was just a simple human being, filled with love and compassion for all humankind. I will never forget the first time I met him. I was 15 years old in the 10th grade in 1955, growing up on a farm outside of Troy, Alabama, when I heard the voice of Martin Luther King Jr. on the old radio. He was talking about Rosa Parks and the Montgomery bus boycott. He was talking about the ability of a disciplined and determined people to make a difference in our society. When I heard his words, I felt like he was speaking directly to me. I felt like he was saying, John Lewis, you can do it. You can make a difference in a struggle to defend the dignity of all humankind.
You can find more at OneDetroitPBS.org or subscribe to our social media channels and sign up for our One Detroit newsletter. From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support for this program provided by the Cynthia and Etzel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. The Kresge Foundation. Community Foundation for Southeast Michigan. The DTE Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public TV, among the state's largest foundations committed to Michigan-focused giving. We support organizations that are doing exceptional work in our state. Visit DTEFoundation.com to learn more. Business Leaders for Michigan. Dedicated to making Michigan a top 10 state for jobs, personal income, and a healthy economy. Nissan Foundation. Ally. And viewers like you.